안녕하세요 여러분 대사관 전문 PD 나누리입니다 잠시 시간을 거꾸로 돌려볼까요? We are turning back the clock to 1963 1923년에 대한민국은 12개 국가와 수교를 맺었습니다 And one of them is Canada In celebration of the 60th anniversary of diplomatic ties between Korea and Canada We've invited some very special guests 도착하셨어요 Let us introduce you to them 
Korean President Yoon Suk yeol announced the key points for Korea's new Indo-Pacific strategy in his opening remark at the ASEAN summit held in Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy emphasizes freedom, peace, and prosperity, and its three principles are tolerance, trust, and mutual benefit. President Yoon also emphasized that Korea would go beyond Northeast Asia to the Southeast Asia, South Asia, as well as Oceania, and African countries on the Indian Ocean, all within the Indo-Pacific region to strengthen strategic cooperation. The Korean government also outlined nine core lines of effort that include establishing a regional rules-based order and expanding comprehensive security cooperation. And in November 2022, the Canadian government announced Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy, which includes a comprehensive framework for the Canadian government to engage in the Indo-Pacific region over the next decade. CIPS emphasizes the significance of the Indo-Pacific region, saying it is rapidly becoming the global center of economic dynamism and strategic challenge, and outlines five interconnected strategic objectives. The Canadian government is also set to make investments of almost 1.7 billion US dollars over the first five years in order to achieve these objectives. As the ambassador said, we can find many similarities between the two countries' Indo Pacific strategy, right? Ambassador Nanaher, what are the biggest outcomes expected from cooperation between Indo Pacific countries? This is the area where there's global focus. I think 40% of the global economy in, in Indo-Pacific, and it's supposed to only increase. Um, there's still many geopolitical tensions in this region. Of course, the Korean Peninsula is one of them. And then on climate change, quite frankly, the, the problems and the, and the solutions both exist in the Indo-Pacific for the entire planet. So as Ambassador Winnie mentioned, without an active role for Canada, we're not in control of our own destiny. Mm -hmm. So, Master Edwards, last October, Canada announced its intention to join the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework for Prosperity. Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, is a platform for multilateral economic cooperation, launched by the U.S. with other founding member countries. It was initiated by the U.S. with the goal of combating China's growing influence in the Indo-Pacific economic region through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. There are 14 participating countries in IPEF. The total population of the member countries accounts for around 32% of the global population, and their total GDP is about 40% of the global GDP. Since September 2022, the member countries have been negotiating the four pillars of cooperation in trade, supply chains, clean economy, and fair economy. As of November 2023, three out of the four pillars have been agreed upon, and the negotiations for Pillar 1 are ongoing. So why does Canada want to join the IPF? Well, for some of the same reasons that Ambassador Danaher has referred to, and that is the fact that um, we have always been an Asia player. We have played in the Indo-Pacific before it was called the Asia-Pacific. Uh, we are simply tied here economically uh, and uh, for reasons, again, that Ambassador Daneker said, with the growth of the region, uh, we need to be embedded in all of the organizations in the region. Unfortunately, we're not in that agreement and uh, we need to get there and uh, we're grateful that, uh, that the Korean government, we believe, will support our membership. But we need also be elsewhere as well and that's what we're working on. So if Canada joins the IPF, how can Korea and Canada cooperate within this framework? This economic framework provides just that, which is a, um, uh, an economic, a looser kind of economic arrangement, not like a trade agreement, but it provides uh, opportunities for not only working with each other through the framework, but more importantly, working in the Indo-Pacific region and the ASEAN countries and so on. Mm -hmm. So, Ambassador Mohini, let's talk about our economic relations. So, how do you evaluate Korea-Canada economic exchanges so far? 
Well, very strong. Uh, it's incredible growth. This was, as Ambassador Danaher mentioned, the first free trade agreement, bilateral free trade agreement in the region was with Korea, coming up on its 10th anniversary. Uh, we've seen tremendous growth from year to year in our economic exchanges. Korea and Canada have a complementary trade relationship, exchanging resources and manufactured products. As of August 2022, Canada was the 18th biggest export market for Korea, and Korea was the sixth biggest import market for Canada. The Korea-Canada FTA, signed in 2014, was a major turning point for their economic cooperation. Back in 1965, trade volume amounted to just 4 million U.S. dollars. But in 2022, it surpassed 16 billion U.S. dollars. In particular, trade volume in 2022 increased by about 25 percent compared to the previous year and was the highest yet. As of 2022, the main export items from Korea to Canada include cars, reagents for diagnoses and lab tests, and phones. The main Canadian export items to Korea include coal briquettes, iron ore, copper ore, and gas. In terms of investment, there's traditionally been more Korean investment in Canada than the other way around. In the past, most Korean investments in Canada were focused on resources. But more recently, that focus is turning to batteries, AI, and other new industries. But there's still potential. So there's still uh, lots for us to build on. And I think we've seen, for example, some significant Korean investments into Canada, into our electric vehicle battery sector. And I think that's a sign of the kind of new forward-looking economic partnership where we're working to create jobs in both countries and build on each other's strengths and demonstrate those sort of complementarities, Korean know-how, expertise, research, Canadian skills, natural resources, uh, labor, bringing that all together to create uh, better circumstances and technological advances for everyone. So looking really to move into some of the new sectors, for example, AI. I think that's uh, going to be a very interesting area for Canada and Korea to cooperate. Mm -hmm. 안녕하세요, 여러분. 저는 지금 한국과 캐나다 관계에 새로운 미래를 열어줄 이벤트가 하나 생겼다고 해서 오늘 그 현장에 가보려고 합니다. 그럼 저와 함께 가보실게요. The place we are looking at today is right here. There's the opening ceremony for the Korean Representative Office of Expert Development Canada. EDC is Canada's expert credit agency that supports Canadian companies succeed on the world stage. So EDC's sole office will be supporting Canadian companies exporting to Korea. And we both know that we have much more that we can do together and Export Development Canada's EDC's arrival here in Korea is testament to our country's confidence and optimism in this partnership. 서울 대표 부설립이 앞으로 한국 캐나다 사이 경제 영역에 새로운 활력을 불어 넣어 줄수 있을까요? I have decided to meet with the Senior Vice President of EDC to learn more about their vision and expectations for Korea and Canada's economic cooperation. So why did you decide to open Seoul office? And why now? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's actually a really easy one. Uh, the opportunity is just too, too great to ignore. Canada is a trading nation, and uh, Canada's future uh, in terms of its success uh, as a trading nation is contingent on expanding uh, where there are opportunities. And uh, there are uh, many an opportunity in, in Korea and more broadly in the Indo-Pacific region. So what kind of market is Korea for Canada? There are so many parallels between uh, what uh, Korea's priorities are and what uh, Canada's priorities are. So if we think about 
supply chain resiliency or the, uh, the clean energy transition. Mm -hmm. um, there are so many opportunities because Canada has a lot to offer in, in the sectors. Another uh, sector that is quite exciting is agri-food. I think uh, food security is going to be a critical topic uh, um, for, for many countries, uh, but specifically for Korea. Korea is a net food importer, and um, uh, Canada has a lot to offer in, in this regard. So here too, I think that there are many areas uh, for us to cooperate. So, Mr. Garner, I have to ask you this because you have <laughs> such an impressive background. <laughs> so, you are the first Canadian to go into space. So, do you think that the two countries can cooperate in aerospace area? I, in fact, I mentioned that this morning at the forum that we should mm -hmm. cooperate because. Uh, Korea has a very impressive space program. Uh, you have your own rockets, uh, you have developed satellites, you have a very ambitious program going ahead. And Canada is a long established uh, player in the space arena. With the challenges that exist today, particularly with respect to climate change, I think that there is good room for us to cooperate in Earth observation uh, because the planet is changing. And if we work together, perhaps there are some important projects that we could do whereby we would put spacecraft in orbit so that they could look down at Earth and see how it is changing. And that's, that is very, very important for us to understand how climate change is affecting the planet. That's just one example. But we are two very similar space nations, and I think that it would be great if we cooperated. Mm. So, Ambassador Mohini, many Koreans visit Canada for studying abroad, immigration or travels. There are many different forms of exchange happening between the people of Korea and Canada. First, in the area of tourism, the number of tourists traveling to and from the two countries in 2019 both surpassed 200,000. These numbers diminished significantly because of COVID-19, but they've been back on the rise since 2022. Many Koreans are also immigrating to Canada. Since 2017, Canada has taken second place as an immigration destination for Koreans. The number of Koreans leaving for Canada to study abroad recorded around 16,000 in 2019, but it decreased to around 10,000 in 2020 due to COVID-19. And up until 2020, Koreans came third in the overall number of foreign students studying in Canada. There are also many young Koreans visiting Canada through the Working Holiday Program, available to people between 18 and 30. And the 60th anniversary of Korea-Canada relations saw the launch of the new Canada-Korea Youth Mobility Arrangement and the annual quota for the number of Koreans to take on the program in Canada increased from 4,000 to 12,000. The maximum age limit also increased from 30 to 35. How do you see the future prospects of people-to-people -people exchange between Korea and Canada? All positive there too. It was one of the main achievements of the recent summit meeting between President Yoon and Prime Minister Trudeau was to launch uh, an enhanced youth mobility agreement, so to offer opportunities to youth in both countries to travel, study, and work in the other country. So uh, I see lots of potential, seeing lots of Canadians who are interested in coming to Korea, uh, lots of Canadians of Korean heritage who want to come back uh, to Korea, uh, see it from a Canadian perspective. Lots of Koreans who study, work in Canada and contributed tremendously to our culture and our economy, society. So it's really the bedrock of the Canada-Korea relationship for those close people-to-people -people ties. Mm. What's one of the best ways to promote people-to-people -people exchange? Culture is definitely one of them. It's one of the best ways to learn about each other. That's right, Tok Tok. 
Actually, the Canadian Embassy organized an event so we can learn more about Canadian culture. It is the Canadian Film Festival. The first Canadian Film Festival in Korea is taking place this year in celebration of the 60th anniversary of Korea-Canada diplomatic relations. And this festival stands, we hope, as a symbol of the shared commitment to cultural exchange and understanding. This year, you can choose from 15 different Canadian films centered around diverse themes. There is also a very special ceremony. The International Federation of Film Critics Korea awarded the Foreign Film Award to the Korean Canadian director Anthony Shim. His latest film, Rice Boy Slips, is about a Korean immigrant mother and son in Canada. Ew, what's he I the other kids not in trouble. They be racist to him every day, teasing him to funny face. Mrs. Kim, and please. He has to fight for himself. We've decided to have a chat with the director himself. So I heard that it reflects your own experience, the movie. So what made you come up with this movie at first? Originally, I wanted to make a film that touched on my experiences uh, growing up as an immigrant in Canada. And I had felt like, I, you know, I had never seen a film that really captured, uh, that captured and encapsulated that immigrant experience in the way that I understood it, in the way that I experienced it. So I wanted to try and make something that was authentic and, and honest to you know, the experiences my family had and, and, and those around our family also had. So Korean culture is getting a lot of attention from the world. So I wonder if the interest in Koreans or Korean culture in Canada has increased that much. Oh, insanely so. I mean, for those who've seen Rice Boy Sleeps, there's scenes where other people don't understand, you know, things like food like kimbap or, you know, even kimchi. And these things were so foreign at the time. And now it's everywhere. So it's, it's, it's a bit weird now just to see, like, how much Korean things that are around the city. Um, it's exciting it's, and it's great. So do you think movies can help break down the barriers that people of different cultures have to each other? Absolutely. It's, I mean, why do we watch movies? We, you know, it allows us to experience uh, emotions and, 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 and be exposed to situations and people and culture and language that are foreign to us and allows us, you know, to, 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 be, to have our eyes open to those new things. And, and so as a result, when films are effective and does its job, then it does exactly that. It breaks barriers and allows people to uh, uh, learn things about other people and other, other ethnicities and nationalities and cultures that we just weren't aware of prior to. As he said, I hope that Korea and Canada can become one step closer through film and culture and have more people-to-people -people exchange. I want to ask this question to all of you. Um, the global situation has changed rapidly in recent years due to various incidents such as COVID, the Russia-Ukraine war, and the Israel-Hamas war. So, in this situation, how should the two countries cooperate on the world stage? 
I think you're right. The world has changed. Uh, and I don't think it's going to return to what it was before. And so how do we move forward in this new world where there are new tensions that exist? Uh, because Korea and Canada are so similar, we are democracies, we are similar sized economies, because we believe in the rule of law, uh, I think that it is important for countries like Korea and Canada, which you could call middle powers, to work together and to be voices in the world at a time when the superpowers, I think, um, are doing all the talking. It would be good to hear from many countries uh, that have like-minded interests, such as Korea and Canada, so that their voice can be heard and perhaps influence how we move forward, uh, because we're not going to go back to what it was before. I, by definition, agree with everything my former foreign minister says. So he captured it perfectly. But I think it really is that essence of partnership. We have shared interests internationally. And we need to be good diplomats together um, and uh, do all we can to uh, reinforce the effectiveness of the international institutions that exist. Um, and so Canada and Korea have a lot to do together on human rights, on free trade, on upholding the rule of law uh, around the world, um, and sharing expertise. I, I know also Canada feels very strongly that Korea is a wonderful example. You're one of the only countries who's gone from being a recipient of international aid to a major donor, and all while having a vibrant democracy. That is the kind of narrative that is very compelling internationally, and uh, we want to be able to develop that as we work with other regions in the world. Well, we've always had a close relationship. Um, that's, the, that's the bedrock on which all of this rests. Um, and, of course, there have been times over the last decades when it's been closer and then maybe not so close and so on. But, but what is happening now is truly remarkable, in my view. Uh, uh, there is a coming together of factors and conditions that are really pushing us together. Uh, uh, Minister uh, Garneau has mentioned one, and so has the ambassador, uh, a couple of them. But, um, for instance, today at the, yesterday rather, at the forum, we were talking about artificial intelligence. And it struck me at the time in the conversation that we are small players in the world of, internet, of uh, artificial intelligence. We, don't, we do not bring a lot to the table, but we bring a lot of small things. And I would say we are just as advanced scientifically as the big players, the United States and China. But we don't have the bulk, the economic bulk and power. But we can work together as was pointed out yesterday, to ensure that we, Canada and Korea, have our own particular roles in the very forefront of the technology and its application. Well, globalization brings global opportunities, but it also exposes us to the impacts of global events. And I think uh, for both of our countries, as smaller economies, we feel those global impacts and we want to contribute. I can think of things like pandemics, uh, economic crises, even climate change. We know that we can't do it on our own. And uh, as my colleagues have said here, each of us has our own historical perspective, our own abilities, our own connections. Korea, of course, is here in the Indo-Pacific area. Canada has more traditional links with both Europe and uh, the Americas. So I think we have this convening power on global events and hopefully there's commonalities identified, and we can work as uh, in many laterals or in other fora. So we may see again for the 70th anniversary of bilateral relations. So how do you expect the relationship to have developed by then? Well, obviously the answer is that it will be even stronger than it is today, and I'm confident that uh, that, uh, that will be the case because I think uh, forces are acting on, on, uh, in, in, in a, such a manner that it is so logical, uh, it makes so much sense for our two countries to work together. I think we'll again find two technological leaders um, working together and learning from each other and supporting each other um, and uh, hoping also there'll be a greater sense of security for both countries.
There's every reason why in whatever amount of time you want to put, we will be seen as partners. Partners in the, in the and I hope partners in the G7. It will become a G8 and hopefully Korea will be there dealing with the international issues of the day. And that would include, of course, uh, security cooperation, particularly in the North Pacific area, working perhaps with Japan and with the United States. So there's all sorts of things that the international situation, as troubling as it is, and as unfortunate as it is, it provides opportunity for this relationship that we have not seen in three decades. I think the OECD ranks Canada and Korea, and I don't know who is one and who is two, in terms of uh, higher education achievement. So we're both very intelligent nations, and I would hope we use that intelligence to apply to global problems. I, I agree with my colleagues on where that should be applied in North Pacific and also in contributing to global uh, framework rulemaking and to our institutions, which are so vital as we go on this difficult road ahead of us. We've had some special guests in honor of the 60th anniversary of Korea-Canada diplomatic relations. What have you learned through their stories? What did you feel? I think this was the most memorable part for me. Korea and Canada have always been and still are very good friends. And now there's a strong foundation laid out for us to have a win-win partnership in the future. Using today's episode of Diplomat Talks as a bridge, I hope that Korea and Canada can grow a bond that will become stronger with time. Uh, I was with my wife a few months ago seeing in, in a theater a, a Korean movie called Past Lives. Often dies, we get up, my wife and I, and we say we just feel like we're back in Seoul. I think we've said a lot today about Korea and Canada's long history of friendly relations and it's a really fascinating history. I would wish more people knew about that. 